we are in chapter 3. And um, you notice it's really one long continuation. This letter doesn't seem to be um, breaking apart very easily. Um, you know, he's bringing up the same topics, and we'll get to this near the end, but he, he keeps on bringing up the concept of being a fool versus being wise. And the reason why he has to go into this and, and really seems to hammer it home so much, I think we find there in verse number one. He's addressing this church at Corinth. This is a church, right? So remember, he um, had traveled around and won people to Christ and was kind of getting churches started. And he kept traveling and evangelizing, getting people saved and, and, and helping them get churches started. So now this church has been established in Corinth and he's writing a letter unto them. And he's been hearing different things that have been going on. You know, he's keeping in communication with people as he's traveling and doing his work. He's hearing these different things. But look what he says in, in verse number 1 in chapter 3. He says, And I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. This is not a compliment for this church. He's saying, I'm speaking unto you as if you're a brand new baby in Christ. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with being a babe in Christ when you first get saved. Think about the analogy. You know, and I love God's analogies. They work so well. His, 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 uh, the, the language that he uses. You know, when Jesus Christ said that you need to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. When you're born again, you have a new creature, a new spirit that's born inside of you. You become God's child. And the moment that you put your faith in Jesus Christ is the moment that you become a babe. In Christ, just like physically when we're born, the day of your birth, hey, you're a baby. You need to be nourished. You need to be fed. Now, a baby doesn't start off eating, you know, a steak dinner and a baked potato and, a, you know, and food like that. He has to grow off of his mother's milk, right? That's all his body can handle. That's all he knows. That's what he's able to do because he's just a baby. He can't handle anything else. But as, as a baby grows, you know, the baby needs to get weaned from the mother's milk because the baby, you know, as they get older and bigger and their bodies get bigger, they need more energy. They need more nutrition. They need more to sustain them to keep them healthy and alive. They need to actually start eating food. And you start them off on the, the easy, soft solids, and then it, you know, it grows from there. Now, he's referring to them as unto babes. He's saying, look, I couldn't even speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. And that word carnal just means fleshly, right? Like they're, like they're, they're walking in the flesh and not in their spirit. They're, they're, he's talking to them as just being very carnal Christians and not, um, <coughs> not focused on the things that they should be and not growing because they're not walking in the spirit. And we're going to get to all that in just a minute. Look at verse number two. He says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. Saying, He's, I've given you milk because you weren't able to take the meat. I've only been teaching you really simple things. And see, we ought not to want to be a baby forever. Like There's nothing wrong with being a baby when you're first born. You, you, you have to start somewhere. You have to start growing. right? You need to have the sincere milk of the Word and remember this too, like, you know, I think most of the people in this room have been saved for a while, but even if you haven't, if, if um, you know, when you, if, you, if you're not saved, if you haven't been saved, or if you've been saved a short period of time, look, you're not going to understand everything in the Bible. Don't think you need a different Bible version, you need to get the NIV because you can't understand all this stuff. No. When you first get saved, you are not going to be able to understand everything because you're a baby. It's just some things are going to go over your head. But you know what? You still will be able to get the milk from the Word. You'll still be able to get some teaching out of it. And you'll need to continue. And I'll tell you this right now. If you may have been saved for years, but if you have not read the Bible cover to cover, guess what? You're a baby. I believe that. You need to have full knowledge. You have to have at least read through the Bible once. You, if you haven't even read through it once, you don't know what all the Bible says. At all. You don't even, like, let alone understand all of it. If you don't even know what it says, I think you're still a baby. We don't want to be stuck as babes in Christ. Because as a babe, you're going to be a lot more carnal, a lot more fleshly. You need to get understanding. You need to be in this book and, and read and grow. And don't get so worried when you don't understand things. 
As you get older spiritually, you'll start to understand more. Don't, don't get stuck on things. Don't let that discourage you. I, I've always recommended this to people. Say, yeah, but I don't understand what this means. Well, think about it and pray about it. Pray that God will open up that understanding to you. But if it doesn't happen immediately, keep going. Keep reading. Because oftentimes, you will find the answer to what you're looking for somewhere else in the Bible. And if you keep those types of things in your mind, and say, I don't really know what this means, as you read later, you'll be like, oh, this kind of ties together. Maybe this means, you know, whatever. And, um, and sometimes you just need to have more foundation, more doctrines, more milk to, to, to strengthen you up to the point to where you could be ready to eat some more heavy meat. But Paul's saying here, he said, look, I fed you with milk and not with meat. I didn't give you anything really complicated. I didn't give you any of the deep knowledge and wisdom from God because you weren't even able to bear it because you're still just a baby. You need to get this milk. You need to get these basics, these basic doctrines, these basic fundamentals. You've got all kinds of things going on here that, um, that need to be fixed in order for you to start learning and growing and getting to that next level in your Christian life. Um, Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 5. I'll read for you from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, talking about being a newborn babe in Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, these are all things of the flesh. This is being carnal, all the, the malice and the, the guile being, being you know, tricky and, and deceiving people and having hypocrisies and envying other people, evil speaking, talking bad about people. He says, laying all that aside, as newborn babes desire, and this is a command, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. As a newborn babe in Christ, you ought to want to hear God's word. You should have that desire to learn more and to grow and to know more. He says, that you may grow thereby. We need God's word in order to grow. We need to be hearing this and receiving it, reading it, going to church, hearing it preached to grow thereby. God's word is what's going to help you to grow. You're in Hebrews chapter 5. Look at verse number 12. Paul's criticizing the, the, the Hebrews in verse 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. He's saying, look, for the time, for the amount of time that you've been saved, that you've been in this and you've been hearing this stuff, you should be teachers by this point. I mean, you should have been growing and learning, and now you should be able to teach, but... You're like a baby. You still need the milk. After all of this time, you are, you are someone who just needs to get the milk. And that's a shame. He says, look what he says in verse 13. He says, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. He said, if you still need milk, you're, it's because you're a baby. It's because you're unskillful in the word. You don't know the Bible. You're not, you're not skillful and you don't know it at all. Verse 14, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. This is how we grow as a Christian. Now, verse 14 is extremely important because it tells you that the, the meat belongs to those who are full age. You have to be grown to really understand the deeper concepts, to really get the meat out of God's word. And the way that you do that says, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So you need to be, in order to be skillful in the word, it's not just enough to read it. Hey, reading is at the starting point. I mean, that's the, the very basic desire to learn more from God's word. But as you're reading it, as you're learning it, you need to put it into use. There's many ways to put God's word into use. One way is when you see things that it tells you not to do, to stop doing those things. That's one way of putting God's word into use. But another way is when it says, hey, you need to be doing this. 
That's another way to put it into use. It's not enough just to hear this stuff or even just to know. You have to live it. You have to not be a hypocrite. You have to be able to say, yes, this is what I believe and this is also what I do and put it into use. And as you show God that you have respect for his word and that you believe it and that you're going to start living for it, he's going he's to say, oh, okay, you're growing now. I'll give you some meat. I'll help you to learn even more. I'll give you a lot more to, uh, to understand and to know because you are being more skillful and you're growing. You're, you're taking what you've learned and you're applying it. There's, um, you know, parables where, where the Bible's talking about how, you know, if you're not faithful in that which is least in the little things, who's going to give you anything that's really important to do? Right? And, this, and this is a, a much oversimplification of the parable. Basically, he's saying, you know, you need to show that you're worthy of doing even the smallest things. So God doesn't, you know, and, and Apostle Paul here was telling them pretty basic things that they needed to do. And what, what were they doing? They were saying, oh, well, I'm of Apollo and I'm of Cephas. And they just had these men that were just their leaders and like they were just kind of making these little factions based on who their, their, their idol was, who their leader was. Instead of actually, you know, saying, well, we're all serving Christ and getting to work instead of worrying about, oh, well, you believe him. And, you know, kind of just making these, these uh, divisions that, that shouldn't have been going on within the church. <clears throat> Let's go back to 1 Corinthians. Because what he brings up here, even in that first verse, he brings up this idea of a carnal Christian. Now, there's people out there today that don't even believe there is such a thing as a carnal Christian. They don't believe that it's possible for a Christian to be carnal or to be fleshly. And though it's not a nice way to say it, it's just stupidity. The Bible flat out says, he, say, I mean, he says here in verse number one, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. He's equating people who are babes in Christ basically as being carnal. Why? Because it's a brand new creature. In order to be walking in the spirit, you know, you need to strengthen your spirit. You need to learn and to grow. But when, at the point you get saved, your flesh is strong. You've been walking in your flesh for however, for your whole life, basically, until that moment you got saved. You have a strong flesh. Now, praise God, you've got a new spirit now that's going to drive you to do good. It's going to help you to, to guide you and to instruct you. But you still have a really strong flesh. The moment you get saved, you've got a strong flesh that's going to try to pull you right back into doing things that are bad and wrong and wicked. And the only way you're going to overcome that flesh is by strengthening and growing your spirit. And the way you're going to do that is by, by getting in the Word and doing it and, and starting to do the things that are right and good. Look at verse number three. He says, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? He said, look at all these things you're doing. You're, you're carnal. You're envying other people. You have all these strifes and, and fights and, divi and division within the church. He says, you're carnal. And most of the people who believe that there's no such thing as a carnal Christian are the people who believe in like the lordship salvation. The people that will say, well, the works will automatically follow absolutely every single time, no matter what, once a person gets saved. You know, these are the people that are always looking for the evidence. Say, oh, well, you need to make God the Lord of your life. And if you're doing these other things and he's not really the Lord of your life and you're not really saved, the people want to say, oh, yeah, oh, this person's drinking, they're drunk or whatever, they can't be saved. They can't be saved because they're doing, you know, they're acting out the, the impulse of the flesh. And they'll say that means they must not have the spirit because they're walking in the flesh. And that, if that were the case, then why would we have so many admonitions? Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. Why would we have so many admonitions to walk in the spirit and not to walk after the flesh you know and and like there's a decision that may be made there you have the choice when you have the holy spirit residing inside of you you have that new creature that's born again and you still have your flesh the choice is up to you to decide hey what am i going to do today am i going to do that which is right am i going to try to please god and walk in the spirit or am i going to quench my spirit silent try to silence that spirit and and not want to listen to that and listen to my flesh, which is driving me to, to get into sin. 
We have a war going on between our spirit and our flesh all the time. So to say that there's, there is nobody that's losing the, own, their, the battle within themselves to their flesh, which would result in a carnal Christian, is ridiculous. But here's one of the proofs that I've seen that they'll like to use. And just like all false doctrine and, and people who believe weird things and, and just heresies, they'll take a verse and they'll rip it out of context, right? They'll, you, you, they'll say, oh, yeah, see? And what they like to do is they'll use Romans 8, verses 6 and 7, but they don't give you the full context. That's up to you to determine. That's why you hear people, you read stuff online, you read books or whatever, and people trying to prove their point and they give you a reference or they'll show you like one Lord. Always, always, always go look it up. Get the whole context and prove whether what they're saying is true. Because you'll see here, look, the Bible says in Romans 8, 6, says for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be. So they're saying, see, you either have the spirit or you have the flesh and if you have a carnal mind, you know, if you say someone's a carnal Christian, they're an enemy of God. And how can a person be saved if they're the enemy of God? And when you just read these two verses and someone's trying to give you that explanation, it's a little bit easier to be deceived. But then we say, well, wait, 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 wait. Let's go, let's go up a verse and let's continue reading a little bit more to see what is this actually talking about. Look at verse number five. It says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Look at this, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. These verses help explain what he's talking about at all anyways. It's saying here, you know, because there's two different ways of looking at it. You could be in the Spirit or you could be walking in the Spirit. So turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5 as I explain this. Galatians 5 is a good way of, of stating this, what I'm, what I'm going to try to explain here. In Romans 8, we saw that, look, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. The Spirit of God comes and dwells in you the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And it never talks about that Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, departing from you. Ever. Show me that. The Holy Spirit comes and resides inside of you the moment you believe on Jesus. So if you, he says, and this is the differential he's making, like either you have the Spirit or you don't. Right? Right? The spirit is life, the, the, the flesh is death, is what he's saying. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead, because he's already telling you, you, have, you still have this dead flesh, this dead body, but the spirit is life. Galatians 5 does a better job of explaining this probably than I'm doing right now. Verse 16 says, This I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, less, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. And this is just defining the struggle that goes on daily between our flesh and our spirit. He's saying, look, you have this flesh that's warring or lusting against your spirit, and they're contrary. They're opposites. One wants you to do good. The other one wants you to do bad. And he's saying the flesh is keeping you from doing the things that you really want to do. But jump down to verse 25. The Bible says, If we live in the Spirit, because you're a believer in Christ, because the Holy Spirit has come and resides inside of you, you live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And this makes the distinction between being saved and having the Holy Spirit living inside of you versus actually then walking in that Spirit and choosing to do what's right. They're two different things. So you can't look at a verse like Romans 8. Can, it appears to be talking more about just being saved and living in the Spirit. 
right? He says, that's why he says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Which is Galatians 5.25 says, if we live in the spirit, and we do. If you're saved, if you're a born again believer, you are living in the spirit, but that's not enough. God wants you to walk in the spirit also. So these people that, that tell you, oh yeah, there's no such thing as a carnal Christian, and why did, why did the Apostle Paul mention it twice in, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3? And that's not even the only place. We're going to see the Apostle Paul himself said that he was carnal. He, the Apostle Paul said that he was carnal. If it's impossible for a Christian to be carnal, then you would have to say the Apostle Paul wasn't saved. And that's ridiculous. But let's flip back, if you would, to Romans chapter 7. We see one more reference to this, to this topic because this is kind of important to understand. We don't want to be carnal Christians. We don't want to be shamed as just, just being like a baby in Christ and not knowing anything because that's what the Apostle Paul was saying to the Corinthians here in chapter 3. He's saying, look, I can't, even, I can't even teach you the wisdom. I can't even teach you the, the, the deep things of God because you're like a baby. I just have to give you some milk and I just have to spoon feed it to you and say, here you go, here's a little bit of milk. And we'll talk about things just like being saved and getting baptized and real basic truths without going in anything deeper. Romans 7, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. This is the Apostle Paul writing this epistle to the Romans. I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do... I allow not, for that I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. And again, that word would, just you could kind of think of that as what he wants to do, right? So he's saying, look, I'm doing the things that I don't want to do, the things that I allow not, and what I do want to do, I'm not doing those things. But what I hate, that's what I'm doing. I'm having this dilemma, I'm having this problem. Why am I doing all these things I don't want to do and I'm not doing the things I really do want to do because the Spirit's try, you know, trying to guide them to do these things. Verse 16, he says, If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. The law is still the law. The law is still good. Even though I'm doing the things I don't really want to do. Verse, seven, uh, verse 17, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. It's not a spirit that wants him to, to, to do this. and that, you know, It's our, our born-again spirit. It's this dead flesh, the sin that dwells in our flesh that's trying to do it. You know, we're going to lose this flesh when we die, but right now it's still with us. He said, but sin that dwelleth in me, for I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, he's being real specific here, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. I still have free will. I have the ability to choose what I'm going to do. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. I'm having a lot of trouble actually going ahead and doing the things that I know I should be doing, is what he's saying. Verse 19. <coughs> For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity of the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Again, he's just, he's just laying out there this, this big difference that we have between the flesh and the spirit. And the spirit wants to do what's right, but it's a hard thing to overcome your flesh and to do those things because your flesh is continually trying to get you not to do the things that are right and try and not doing the things of God. And that is where carnal Christianity comes in, is when people succumb to the flesh, when they allow the flesh to take over and you get sick of the fight and say, I, I'm getting sick of this. I hate all my family and all my friends and all these people just wearing me down. I don't want to do this anymore. We go to church all the time and I'm getting sick of all, you know, trying to follow all of God's rules and your flesh takes over and then you just get into sin. 
I'll tell you what. You may think your, your life might, you might be going through hard times. You might feel stressed out or real difficult and, and things are kind of hard. But you make a decision like that and you just give up and say, forget it. Your life is going to be way worse than it is at that moment when you, things start to feel stressed out. You go back into the world. I'll tell you what. And <laughs> the sins that you think you're going to enjoy you won't have that joy anymore. Once you start living for God and doing what's right and you start to realize the truth of these things, even going, like, if I were to go out to the bar tonight, because this is something I used to love to do, and just go out and start drinking, I would, I would hate every moment of it. Thinking that, like, oh, man, I'm going to have so much fun and stuff, it would not be a good time. Knowing as much truth as I know right now, and you, if you decide to do that, just say, well, I'm just going to start you know, watching all the, the Hollywood and going to the movies and listening. I'm going to do all the things that I like to do before. It won't be the same anymore. And you're going to be more miserable. And, and not only that, God's going to judge you. God's going to treat you like the, a spoiled, brat, disobedient little child as, a, you know, as, as a, someone that needs correcting. And so I don't recommend, hey, do what you want to do. It's your life. You have the will to do it. You have the, the choice to make. But it's a foolish choice to, to decide to just give up and to get into sin. I understand the struggle. We all have it. Everybody does. We all have this flesh, the flesh that hasn't changed. So all the things that you'd like to do before you're saved, you still, your flesh still wants you to do those things. Your flesh is going gonna, is gonna to still try to remind you, hey, do this. and do, you know. For me, the biggest thing is probably with the worldly music because it was such a big factor in my life and something that really is, gave me fleshly pleasure just listening to that. And it, it's always trying to draw me away and draw me away and listen to this stuff. We need to strengthen our spirit to help us to keep strong against these things. But don't tell me that a fleshly, a, a carnal Christian doesn't exist. 1 Corinthians 3. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians. So it says in verse 4, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Now, I covered the whole, you know, the, the putting up a man when we did chapter number one, so I'm not going to get into that tonight. But what I think is really interesting here, look at verse number five, the, the latter part of the verse. He says, basically, Paul and Apollos, all we are is ministers. All we are are servants to God that, that um, is bringing salvation he says, by whom ye believed. You, know, you believed because ministers were sent unto you and preached the word of God. You heard the word of God and you believed it. Romans 10 goes through the whole, the whole uh, process of people getting saved and people being sent to preach the gospel of peace. But look at what he says here. It says, even as the Lord gave to every man. I believe God has a minister for every single person in this world to hear the gospel and get saved. I honestly believe that. It says here, God gave a minister to every man. Everybody has it because the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to be saved. And God, in God's plan, if we were following God's plan, if we were all listening and hearkening unto God, we would be taking our marching orders and going and preaching the gospel to the people who he's sending us to. I believe that that person that heard the gospel today and got saved and put their faith in Christ. I was a minister that was sent to that person and God had known, God had used me and other people, I'm sure, in his life to get that person to believe on Christ. But here's the problem. See, God has ministers for everybody. But we still have free will. And when you decide that you're not going to go soul winning, you're not going to preach the gospel of God, you're not going to do your part, God could have you to be a minister for somebody that's going to get saved, but if you choose not to do it, 
Well, hey, you're the one that God had planned to go out and do it. So you'll be messing up somebody else's chance to get saved, someone else's salvation, because you're not opening up your mouth and preaching the gospel of Christ. You were the minister that God had appointed to go and talk to that person, and you don't do your end of the deal. Verse 6, I have planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And this is important to understand this too. You never want to be puffed up in your soul winning and the efforts of being a minister of the gospel because all the, all the power comes from God. So look, we're, we're God's laborers. We're out doing the work that he's told us to do, but God's the one who brings life. God's the one, you know, it's his word that gets planted as the seed which actually brings forth that new life and that new creature. We're working the ground, we're doing this other stuff, but the seed is of God, right? He's the one that brings the increase. We can work at it all day, and, and we need to, 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 to help things along and to do what God has told us to do, but ultimately God's the one who gets all the credit. He says, I have planted a polished water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So see, sometimes you're going to be going out and you're going to be planting. Sometimes you're going to go out and you're preaching the gospel, you're going to be watering. And sometimes you go out and you're going to be reaping, right? Today, I think that, that gentleman that, that put his faith in Christ today is a perfect example of that. We are talking, we, after, after we gave this man the gospel, you know, and he, he picked up on it really easily, really quickly. He understood the concept very, very quickly. He was just, just ready to get saved. And, you know, I, we showed him verses and stuff, and it was just like, just clicking, no problems, no, no, I don't think that, you know, everything. Eternal security, everything. So then we asked them, well, hey, is there anybody else here that, that you think would want to hear this? You know, is there someone else in the house that, would, that we could talk to? Because that's always a good opportunity to do that. Um, I'm not always the best at doing that, but, you know, I try to every time I remember to ask. I mean, you give someone the gospel and they get saved, always ask, hey, is there anyone else in there? Anybody else? I mean, uh, uh, fa any family members, children, whatever, bring them out. Let's, let, you know, let us talk to them. Because if they just received Christ and believed, then why wouldn't they want anyone else to hear it? So he went in and he's like, well, yeah, my dad's here, but I don't know what he's doing. I don't know if he's going to come out. So just ask him. See if he wants to come out and talk to us. So his dad came out and his dad, it turns out, was saved. And believed right. And he, you know, seemed like a great guy. So what's probably been going on in his life is that he's been hearing the gospel. And he's been hearing, and, and his dad or other people at church or wherever, you know, other places he's been going, he's been hearing it. He's been, you know, the ground's been being plowed a little bit. People have been watered. And then we came at the right opportunity then to be able to reap. So they're saying it's, there's nothing, you know, like, like he that, you know, plants and waters and does this stuff. You know, we're nothing, but God's the one ultimately gets a credit and gives the increase. But sometimes when you go out, that's going to be the case. Other times we go out and we give people the gospel, they don't get saved. Hey, we're planting seeds or we're, you know, we're plowing, we're watering, we're doing things that hopefully someone else will come along then and that person will get saved. But we're all laborers. We work together. And this is what he says. He says, Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. So the husbandry, right? We're like his, his work animals. Jesus Christ had to get in the plow with him. We are workers together with God in getting people saved. You know, people don't like when we say, oh, we got this person saved or that person saved. Or you didn't get anybody saved because God's the one that saves. Well, that's not completely true. Yes, I just got done saying God's the one who gives the life. You know, that's where the life comes from, is from God's word. But that word is not getting planted without having the laborer go out and do it. We, that's why he says right here, we are laborers together with God. Now, without God, we can do nothing. I can't go out and win someone to Christ of my own power and all by myself. I need to have God with me. That's why every time we go out soul winning, we pray, God, fill us with your power. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to go out and do this work. We need God's help. But you know what? God has made it so that he needs us to go out and preach the gospel. Because God is not supernaturally appearing to anybody for them to get saved. 
He's ready and willing to, to bring forth life and to bring the increase. But he's relying on uh, us as the laborers to go out and do that work. We work with God in this effort to get people saved. That's the way that God designed it. So there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, we got this person saved because we put forth effort to help that person get saved. And not only that, it's a work that we're going to get rewarded for. As we see that here. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse number 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So what he's going into now is more of a description about us being God's building. So in verse 9, he said, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. So he's running with that, that um, uh, illustration of being a building. So with a building, the first thing you do is you lay the foundation. Right? And then after you got the foundation laid and settled, then you start building on top of that. Right? You start building. Whatever it is you're building, you start going up from there. The foundation has to be laid. He says, look, every man, let every man take heed how he builds around. He says, you need to pay attention to what you're doing with your life. What are you working? What are you building with your life? What's the work that you're doing? What's the goal? First, you need to make sure everyone's got that foundation. There is no other foundation than Christ. You have to be saved in order to build and do anything for God. In order to do any work for God, you have to start off with that foundation being laid. And that foundation is Christ. But once you have that foundation, once you're saved, hey, it's time to get to work and start building. But take heed how you build thereon. What are you spending your time doing? It says, verse 12, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, Wood, hay, stubble, all kinds of different things that you can use to build on that foundation. He says, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, yet he himself shall be saved yet so is by fire. So what he's talking about is all of our works being tried. At the end of our life, not even just at the end of our life, at the judgment seat of Christ is when this is going to happen. Okay, after the rapture, when, when Jesus starts giving out rewards, all of the work that you've done, there's all kinds of options you could have been doing with your life. Gold, silver, precious stones. You're, put, you're building all this stuff that's great value. Or if it's wood, hay, and stubble. Now wood, hay, and stubble, all three of those things, when you put a fire in that, it's going to go poof. It's going to disintegrate and be nothing. You're going to look at it and be like, whoa, what happened? Here's all my stuff. You're not going to be careful. Okay, here's all my work, Scott. Boom. And then poof, it's going to go up like a Christmas tree, a dead Christmas tree. It, Man, those things go up so high. <laughs> we burned one in our backyard. That thing's going up like the flames going above our roof. And that's all fine and dandy to do here in the winter with the Christmas tree, but you don't want that to be your life's work. I mean, all that work. Think about all the work that you do, all the years that you have on this, on this earth to just poof, be gone. What, what, a, what an empty feeling that, that, that some people are going to have to look back on their entire life on this planet and say, there's nothing. Now, praise God, he adds this, this verse. He says, you know, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Loss meaning that all the things you did are gone. They're good for nothing. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. So, at least you're saved. At least you have, that foundation is going nowhere. You might have built up all kinds of sticks and a little, you know, a little wood house that, that is all going to be burned up, but the foundation remains. Christ is still there, so praise the Lord for that. But honestly, that's not the way you want it to be at the judgment seat. You want to get these rewards. And when you work together for God, see, God's given you the gift of salvation. You don't have to make up for that. There's no way you can attain that. So when you do good works for God, when you go out and do things that have eternal value, things that are going to abide the fire, like other souls being saved, 
other souls receiving eternal life impact done on people's life to go out and, and then you know training other people to go out and win people to Christ that has eternal value because all of a sudden there's going to be more people in heaven as a result of the work that you've done those souls will have everlasting life that is eternal that lasts forever that will abide the fire that type of a work and God rewards you for that he says look at all this that you've done now, it's our reasonable service. We ought to do it. We ought to be look, you know, humble and say, well, God, this is the least I can do, right? I ought to just be doing this anyways because you told me to do it. But God is so awesome that he not only, even though it should just be expected of you, know, you just ought to do this. He turns around then and says, you know what? I'm going to reward you and, and pay you and give you all this extra rewards, whatever those may be, crowns you know, ruling over cities in the millennial reign, whatever. Whatever all the rewards are, he says, I'm going to give this to you because you were faithful and good. And hey, praise God, I'm looking forward to that day. I'm, you know, trying to work really hard so that I, that I don't just have a bunch of wood, hay, and stubble that's going to be burned up, but things that are actually going to last. And that's what we all ought to remain focused on is to keep the things that truly are important you know, people are always looking ahead to the future. It's a good thing to be able to look ahead and, and plan. And, you know, but mostly people do that with their finances and say, okay, well, I want to be able to do this. People look at retirement. I'm going to put money in a 401k and all this other stuff. And they've got all these great plans. And they, you know, some people get it all planned out perfectly. And this is how much money I'm going to have when I retire. I can retire at this age. And I've got this much saved up. And I've got this much in a health savings account. And, and I'll be able to have, you know, $5,000 a month coming in. I'll be a set. And I'll be able to do everything right because I've worked so hard and done all this stuff. And then they look at their spiritual bank account and it's wood, hay, and stubble. So you get yourself set in this life to be able to retire and, and take it easy for 10 years, maybe. And you invest so much time and effort and energy into that. But you're going to have no rewards at the end of your life that are going to last eternally, that are going to last way longer than 10 years. Some people, that's, they're not even going to get to that point. <coughs> Of being able to retire you don't know when you're gonna breathe your last breath so let's make the best of it right now and keep retain the important focus so that at the judgment seat of Christ you know we're taking heed right now what we do and how we build upon the foundation of our own salvation let's keep reading here uh, we're almost done with the chapter here verse 16 know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, I'm going to get into this a little bit more in depth when we get into chapter 6 in a few weeks. But I am going to cover this slightly. In uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, the Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? And what we just read here in, in verses 16 and 17, he's saying, look, your body is the temple of God. And we need to keep this in mind. The Holy Spirit is living inside of us. The Holy Spirit goes with us everywhere that we go. Keep that in mind. The things that you decide to put in front of your eyes, the Holy Spirit's there with you. The places you choose to go and the people you choose to be around with, guess what? The Holy Spirit's right there with you. And the things that you do with your body and in your flesh, the Bible's saying that's the temple of God. You've been purchased. You were bought with Jesus Christ's blood. You belong to Him. What do you think you're doing now going out and, and, and sticking pins and needles and piercings all throughout your face and your body and just defiling the temple and printing it up with a bunch of marks and tattoos all over the place? Maybe just eating all kinds of junk and letting your body go and, and, and get really obese and, and, and not even physically capable to do the work of, of going out and, and being able to walk up and down the streets and preach the gospel because you've just let yourself get so out of, out of shape with the temple of God. 
Or how about smoking, drinking, doing drugs, do all these types of things impact your body. Your body is the temple of God. You know, Bible, oh, the Bible doesn't say anywhere that smoking is a sin. You're right, it doesn't. But the Bible says that your body is the temple of God. Now, think about this. It's very important to keep this in mind because this is not talking about going to hell or our salvation. When it says that, uh, you know, God's going to destroy, where it say, that for if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. God could end your life. That's what we're talking about, destroying. And your body, you're, you're, you're going to mess with the temple of God and do all these things he's telling you not to do. God can make your life end very quickly if he, if he chooses to. He says, you know, make sure you treat God's temple with respect. I mean, think about the higher standard and the more respect or reverence that you might have when you walk into a church, right? Now, I know there's going to be people saying, no, the church isn't a building. I know it's not a building, but we congregate in a place, and normally people still have some type of respect or reverence for whatever place that is, even when it was meeting in my house. When you're going to church and going to be around people of God, normally you'd probably have a little bit more respect for the place that you're in and for the people that you're around and for the things that you would say and for the way that you would dress because you have reverence for the house of God and the local church is the house of God. And people, normally people, I mean, people who aren't even saved, when they walk into a church, will typically have more respect and will, will talk decent. If, if they're people that just every other word is a, is, a, is a foul word, you know, you'll see these same people sometimes, they'll walk into a church somewhere and they'll tone it down. Why? Because they're, because they're trying to show respect for a house of God. Right? I mean, it makes sense. What I'm saying, it shouldn't come as a shock to anybody that you would act that way, that you'd have a little bit more respect or reverence when you go into the house of God, where the Bible's telling you that your body is the temple of God. So the same level of respect and, and the way of thinking that you have about going into a place or going into church where, where God's people are congregate, you ought to have that same mentality about your own body and treat it appropriately. And not be flippant about the things that you do with your body. We'll see in chapter 6, he's talking about fornication, because that's another sin that involves your flesh. Just going and making your flesh you know, one with a harlot, or with a whore, or with someone who's not your wife and committing adultery. I'm going to rail on that in a few weeks. I can't wait. But let this sink in that your body is the temple of God, and we ought to do our best, you know. When you learn things, you say, hey, this is actually really bad for me. You know, this fluoride is really bad for my body. This, you know, this GMO stuff is really bad for my body. Try and not, you know, trying to avoid that. Now, look, I know it's not easy in the world that we live in to avoid everything. Okay? But if you could at least treat your body with some respect and say, I, don't, I want to be able to be used by God to the utmost. I know that the Holy Spirit is residing within me. And I want to I want to be able to be used to the you know I'm not going to be smoking I'm not going to be drinking I'm not going to be you know doing drugs and all these things are going to damage my body that could limit how much I can do for God and ultimately limit how many rewards you can get. Let's wrap up this chapter here. Where will we leave off? Verse number eighteen. He says, let no man deceive himself. If any among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Now, <laughs> we often have such a tendency to deceive ourselves. We have the habit of justifying our sins. You know, trying to trick ourselves into thinking, well, this is really okay. Even though you know it's not, you want to try to deceive your own selves by rationalizing that what you're doing, it really isn't that bad. It's really not that sinful. You know, oftentimes people will think that they're so wise and they'll know the reasons. Because what it says here, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. So the, you know, the seemingly wise man in this world, 
might be able to, to justify and know the reasons why, for example, you know, drinking alcohol is just fine in moderation. Because the Bible teaches against being drunk, but I can, I can drink and be just fine with that. And they think that someone like me would be a fool that says that no Christian should be drinking any alcoholic beverages. Because alcohol is poison, because it's wicked, because the Bible says not to even look upon the wine when it's red, when it giveth its color in a cup, when it moveth itself aright. These people need to become like a fool, the people who they think are fools, in order that they may be wise. And, you know, this is a great verse I heard recently on this, and I hadn't, I can't remember hearing this applied previously, but, I mean, this is so perfect for people who think that social drinking is okay. Romans chapter 13. In Romans 13, verse 13, the Bible says, Let us walk honestly, as in the day. So, walking upright, honestly, all things out in the open, that, that you know, people shouldn't have any reason to even suspect you or accuse you of doing anything wicked or doing anything sinful. He says, Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, verse 14, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and... Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. You know what one of the lusts of the flesh is? It's going to be to get drunk. I was mentioning that earlier in the sermon. That's one of the lusts of my flesh. It's to go out and get drunk. But the Bible says not to make provision for the flesh. So what does that mean? Don't even give, make the possibility come up to even allow your flesh to indulge in that and to get drunk. For example, getting drunk, right? Now, this is talking about everything. Don't make provision for, provision for the flesh. But if I say, well, you know what? It's, o it's okay to have one or two drinks. I just won't get drunk. Well, as soon as you crack open and start, you know, drinking that alcohol, you know, taking those shots or drinking that beer, you have now just made provision for your flesh to continue drinking and to get drunk. The Bible says don't even, make, don't even make that option. That's why whenever we, um, you know, if, if someone needs a ride to church and it's a female, I don't go and pick up that person and, or, or even out soul winning, you know, if there's just you know, a, a young woman that's at home by herself and says, okay, come on in. I'm not going to go into that house and say, oh, no, thanks, I'm fine right here. Stay out in the open. Why? Because I'm so worried I'm going to commit adultery. No, but you know what? I'm not even going to make I'm not even going to make that opportunity come up and be a possibility whatsoever. You stay away from it. The Bible says flee fornication. Stay 100% away as much as possible. And as soon as you put yourself in certain situations, you could be making provisions for your flesh. You say, yeah, but I'm there to preach the gospel. Yeah, but that door closes and you two are in there by yourself. For one, it doesn't look good, but for two, I mean, you know, let every man take, every man that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. So whether it's drinking, whether it's fornication, well, any of these things, we need to make sure that we're not making provision for our flesh. You know, a lot of people think that they're so wise and they're so smart and they get a little proud. You need to become a fool. Oh, those things would never happen to me. Take heed. Let's finish up the chapter here. Verse 20, And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great words of wisdom. God, I pray that you would please help us to continue to grow in our spirit. Lord, um, help us to preach the gospel to people that they would get saved and become babes in Christ. Lord, but help us also not to just be content with people becoming babes in Christ or that ourselves, Lord, that we wouldn't be babes in Christ, that you would help us to grow and to walk in our spirit and to help teach others to grow, dear Lord, and to help feed those that, that aren't ready for strong meat yet, but they need milk. Help us to, uh, to go out and, fee and, and feed those new converts, dear Lord. 
the babes in Christ. I pray that you would please help us to, to, um, to have a heart to, to continue to try to teach and disciple people and that um, you would help us to put into action the things that are written in your word that we could strengthen our spirit that we can be full adult Christians ready to, uh, to be able to eat all the, the strong meat that you give us, dear Lord, and help us to show ourselves faithful that you could give us more things to serve you with, dear Lord, and to bring more honor and glory unto your, your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.